One of the things that the internet has done is it's provided an equality of participation that we perhaps haven't had previously when uh, we were dealing with physical knowledge artifacts. You had to have a book in your hand or a book in the library in order to make sense of its content or in order to be able to read and share it with your students. What the network has done, the internet specifically, is it's reduced the barriers to participation. So now with a blog post or with tools on an average laptop, I can create a video, I can log on to free services online, connect with other colleagues and other individuals. So when individuals or teachers start thinking about creating a personal network, the first thing I would encourage is that they look at their expectations. And in particular, I would encourage an expectation of experimentation. If you're teaching students in one part of Argentina or in one part of Brazil or in Spain or in Canada, those students will have different needs, they'll have different knowledge levels based on grades, so not every answer is the same. So it requires personal experimentation to build what's sometimes called a personal learning environment. So it's this concept that instead of interacting with one another, through a space that an institution owns, such as a classroom, or a space that, uh, such as Moodle or a learning management system, what individuals do instead is they begin to connect different kinds of tools that the individual teacher, the individual student has control of. And by connecting these tools and using these tools for information and interaction, uh, individuals form a personal learning environment. The biggest reason to learn or to develop a personal learning environment is to become knowledgeable as an educator around the way that knowledge is work, uh, works and is developed in a digital era, first and foremost. The second reason is that you can't really impart to students what you don't have. And the students that are being raised in the school system today or that are moving through the system today they're going to need to know how to participate in distributed environments. They're not going to be able to go to one place and find the right answer. They're going to have to take a lot of these different answers, a lot of different pieces of information, and try to make sense of it to make an informed decision either in their personal life or in their work. One of the important aspects of the learning process that students need to learn is that it's social. It's connected. It's networked. It doesn't send the right message to students if we say, learn in social connected ways, but I'll teach you in one way. So the importance of teaching together is that it gives students a multi-dimensional experience of knowledge. It teaches students the importance of being connected and collaborating with others in activities that we're involved in. And I think it also gives the students a much richer experience because it helps them to begin thinking about if we saw how these teachers teach together, how should we collaborate in our group work or how should we collaborate with students from other parts of the world? And I'm a particularly strong advocate for teaching with people from other parts of the world. Uh, in a global society, I think it's very important that we have access to the ideas and the concepts from other regions of the world. Now, in the long run, I think it's the responsibility of senior administrators and political leaders to recognize these broad changes in society and to begin to change the system as a whole. But a single teacher in their classroom, I think, is better served by experimenting with new approaches and new technologies in a way that she can, in the way that the system allows her, rather than becoming too radical so as to basically be fired. So I think that's an important reality that teachers have to think about. Now there's many practical ways that they can do this. You can do small things like beginning starting a blog on your own and sharing parents a link to the blog so they can see what you did in class today. Or you can have students in a closed space, not so everyone can read it, but you can have students learn how to begin writing online. Again, it could be through a closed blog. In a classroom, you can have students start playing with video recordings and remixing videos. And you can teach them how to begin to learn or function in a social network that maybe includes students from other cities. Now, none of these things mean you have to change your curriculum yet. These are all systems that allow you to change the teaching and learning process. What's different today, I think, is that 
the knowledge pieces are fragmenting more fat more rapidly and there's more fragments than there used to be so what used to be let's say a 200 page textbook might today be a five minute video on YouTube or a 10 minute lecture on uh, a different site so the knowledge pieces are smaller now than they perhaps were in the past but the interesting thing is once your knowledge pieces become smaller there are more configurations available so if you have five pieces of information you can connect them a certain number of ways but if you take each of those five pieces and you break them down even smaller so now you have 50 pieces you have many many more ways of configuring those knowledge objects now the question is well how do we do that when you have that many knowledge pieces and I would argue that that's the purpose of two things that's the purpose of the social networks that we're a part of and it's also the role of the technological networks that we participate in more and more on a daily basis so that's where we need to test the validity of the knowledge coherence that we're making but all of these again are part of this process of being networked and connected and we form new ideas and we challenge those ideas through those networks in a global world where content and information is available from everywhere there's a real risk and I see it happening already that countries import the knowledge and the curriculum from other parts of the world so the big countries uh, let's say Spain as one example uh, are providing a lot of the education resources for other countries to consume well what happens when you do that is you lose the local identity and the local culture because you're really importing ideas and knowledge from other regions I certainly encourage sharing but I also encourage cultural awareness in the process so I always look at school systems parts of the world as not just being a net importer of educational content but also being net exporters so even if you import learning uh, content from one part of the world it's important that you change it tweak it experiment it and it export it back to other regions of the world so developing citizenship now is not just about developing citizenship in terms of your local country it's about developing citizenship globally and being a contributor to the global knowledge economy not just your own region